Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. I call my stepdaughter's entitled boyfriend wreck it Ralph. No relation to the trademark cartoon, just coincidental naming. He has a tendency to break, root-tear up everything he touches. My stepdaughter, who is actually a sweet and endearing young woman whom I love dearly, has, like many young women with self-esteem issues, allowed herself to be led astray by WIRR. In the year they've been together, she's lost everything, but at 23, she is old enough to learn her lessons without us parents coming to her rescue until she gets rid of WIR and back on track. When they first got together, they lived with her dad and myself for a few months. It very quickly became apparent WIR had a chip on his shoulder when it came to me. He would carry tales to my husband, causing us to argue. Despite my husband telling WIR many, many times that was my house and everything in it was mine, WIR would keep asking my husband, not me, if he could have this or that, and that's if he asked. He kept getting more and more animals, despite our telling him no more. Neither were taking care of the ones they had. They weren't buying dog or cat food or cat litter, my husband and I were. They weren't picking up the messes, and they weren't training them, allowing them to tear up our belongings. Mary Jane is legal in our state, and there is a dispensary in our town, and the only work these two would do is doctor delivery, her job with a daily payout, just to get enough money for WIR to make a purchase at the dispensary every day along with eating at fast food restaurants. WIR's chip on his shoulder when it came to me was such that they brought my husband a soda one night, walking in the back door right past me, calling out loudly, We got you a your favorite soft drink, to my husband in the living room, with zero inclusion to me. Another example is my stepdaughter asking if she could use my debit card to go get the four of us drinks at a local convenience store. One hot day, my husband and I were unloading stuff from the truck and trailer in the backyard, which was no problem. However, when checking my account, they spent $20 on food for WIR without asking. The end came when I told them they had to replace the bedroom door their dog chewed the bottom out of and refused to allow the pit bull mix they wanted to rescue even though it had a bite history to enter my home. They moved to my stepdaughter's mother's home at that point. During their time there, my stepdaughter kept getting tickets in her car, which is only registered to my husband. They weren't paying their insurance, which I had bought my stepdaughter her own policy and paid the startup out of my money when they lived with us and didn't pay the plate renewal. Now her license is suspended and it cost my husband and I $600 to get the plates. Again, in his name only, unsuspended. Plus they had damaged the car and it needed repairs. So he took it from them. Before her license was suspended, but after the police took the plates from her car, my husband let her use his truck, which was on my insurance policy. WIR drove it and he has no license and blew the motor in it. It is now sitting and can't be used. I told my husband I would put the car on my insurance for him, but only if he drove it. If he returned it to them, I was canceling the insurance, which I've stood by. Nevertheless, WIR called daily, demanding my husband return the car to them once it was legal and fixed. After three weeks, my husband finally said, Look, you dumbass, I don't know what it is that you think you're trying to accomplish here, but you're not demanding anything from me, and you're not getting the car back. I may have originally bought it for her before she got with you, but it is my car in my name and I'm keeping it in lieu of the truck you ruined. Don't call me again about the car. Got it? We had been hearing of ongoing disputes between my husband's ex and WIR. Things got so bad there that YR told my husband's ex-wife to pack her shit and get the F out of her own home. Another time he told her to shut the F up and remember who she's talking to. So we all decided it was time to let our daughter hit rock bottom since she wasn't seeing how UIR had taken her from being a sweet, lovable, well-liked, and responsible girl in a college nursing program to this person with a criminal history and no prospects at the moment. My husband's ex-wife moved in with her boyfriend, turning the power off at the home she'd been renting, and told her former landlord, whom she was actually longtime friends with, she wouldn't allow it to affect their friendship if he evicted them for squatting, since neither were on her lease to. Begin with... When my stepdaughter called wanting to come back, my husband told her she could but WIR could not. Now they are staying at a homeless shelter in the town where WIR's mom lives, and WIR's mom won't let them live with her either. We hate to see her go through this, but this entitled WIR she won't let go of has really brought her down and she can do so much better. This guy actually told us once he couldn't work at a factory that he interviewed at because it was climate controlled and his heart condition won't allow that. 
then argued with me and my husband that climate controlled meant controlled by the climate so it was hot in summer and cold in winter. We haven't seen them hold a job or do anything useful and productive since they've been together, just demand from and use the people who love the girl he's become a cling onto. Here we go. I think it was somewhere between the 90s and barely past 2000 when businesses were using mostly fax instead of email to send documents. There was even some family homes that had a fax machine for one reason or another. As you've probably guessed, our household had a fax machine. To this day, I don't really understand why we had it because it was hardly used. Maybe it was a fashion thing. I don't know. Not far from us were two NHS run places. Or should I say three? Imagine a triangle where one corner was our home. A 10-minute walk away is an HS hospital. Then a 10-minute walk from the hospital and our home is a GP surgery with a care home immediately across the road. As in, step out of the GP surgery and cross the road to get to the care home. As the hospital isn't relevant and this and only gives an idea of the distances we can ignore the hospital. The fax was in the same room as the family computer, so someone was usually in the same room usually my dad or myself, and infrequently someone else in the family. This time, I was sat at the computer working on some document or other when the fax machine came to life. I thought that it must have been something for dad, so I left it to work away. However, after five minutes of printing, I thought something was wrong. Just as I got up to inspect the situation, the printing ended. So I glanced at the fax printout, and it quickly became obvious that this was sent to the wrong place. At the top of the first page of something like 20 pages were two addresses. The send to and sent from addresses. The sent from being the the GP surgery and the send to being the care home across the road from them. And the addresses for both places also included telephone numbers and fax numbers. A quick look at the numbers, and I could see that they were nothing like our number. Apart from the beginning of the number, which was the area code, the rest of the numbers were so far apart you would have thought a random number generator had a fun day. This was obviously not a case of single digits being mistaken like the last number being a 5 instead of a 6. I barely looked any further on the first page when I realized these were medical documents that the GP surgery tried sending to the care home. As these were important, I picked up the phone and called the number on the front page for the care home. The receptionist answered and I explained that we somehow got their facts from the GP surgery. The receptionist was apologetic and was puzzled with how this happened. I asked if they'd like me to drop by with the fax documents as I live so close, but the receptionist instead asked if we had a paper shredder. I said that we do, and she told me to just shred them. I asked if she was certain, and she said yes. We said our goodbyes and ended the call. So I eventually shredded them. I say eventually because just as I was about to reach for the shredder, a thought occurred to me, and I picked up the phone again. I called the GP surgery. After a brief explanation to the receptionist, I was put through someone in the back office. I explained the situation again. The lady was utterly puzzled. She was the one that faxed the documents, and there was no way that she could have confused the care home number with our home number. She said that she'd make a note to their tech department about it. When I asked if she'd like me to return the documents to her, she also asked me to just shred them. Well, that's what I did. As these were important documents and needed shredding quickly, I dug out the shredder and started setting up in the living room. When my mom asked me why I've dug out the shredder, I told her and she was surprised but didn't argue. Because she enjoyed using the shredder, she decided to do the job for me. And that's the end of it. Well, no. You would have thought this was a random once-off thing, but no, it wasn't. The following month, my dad was sat at the computer with me watching over his shoulder when the fax machine came to life. We glanced at it before returning to the computer while waiting for the fax to finish. After a few minutes, we just looked at it, wondering what's happening. Then, it finished up. As I was already standing, I checked to see what came through, and sure enough, it was documents from the GP surgery to the care home. As my dad was informed about what happened last time, I handed them off to him. He did what I did and phoned the care home and then the GP surgery about the situation. Both places were yet again puzzled about the situation and turned down the suggestion that we walk down the road to drop them off. So mom got her fun with the shredder again. And if you think that was the last time, then you're wrong. This happened four more times over the next five months. We have no idea if this problem would have continued if we had kept the fax machine. Dad disconnected it as he eventually lost use for it. None of us knew why we kept getting those faxes. The care home and GP surgery kept telling us to shred them and referring the problem to their tech departments. 
All I can think of is that the GP surgery's machine would get a busy tone from the care home and instead of deciding to wait and retry, it went through some sort of number generator until it settled on the first fax machine within our area code that was free. However, that seems rather far-fetched. So that's it. That was the case of care home fax. The year was 2014, or maybe 2013, I don't know, and I was a freshman in high school. On a general basis, it sucked. One thing in particular that made it extra sucky, though, was gym class. Specifically, this one guy in gym class. This dude's name was Jack McGee. He was the biggest jerk ever. At first, it was pretty standard high school guy in gym class. Level of obnoxious jerk. You know the type. Overly loud, unreasonably aggressive during games. Bossy, tossing the collective brain cell back and forth between his two equally ape-like buddies. The usual, usual. I don't know when exactly it happened, but he developed a sort of eye for me after the first couple of weeks or so. He started asking me bizarre questions that I now believe may have been some sort of innuendo, sitting uncomfortably close to me, resting his hand on my gym shoe, general creepy behavior. He once blocked a doorway with his body. This dude was massive, forcing me to literally squeeze my way through and crawl over him. He then tried to grab me and pin me once I was almost through, but I'm very good at dodging physical contact whenever possible, and dipped on him before his giant gorilla arm could catch me. I still shudder thinking about it. I cannot emphasize enough how terrible this dude smelled. But the true breaking point came during the peak cruelty of this school-mandated sadism. Jim Swim. Before anyone asks, let it be known that yes, I did try to tell someone about this. I told my gym teacher first semester really early on that Jack was making me incredibly uncomfortable. The gym teacher waved it off, saying he was just playing around and that it's probably because he likes you. His suggestion was basically to just put up with it and wait it out, because he was sure Jack would lose interest soon anyways. Spoiler alert, he didn't. Second semester rolls around, and the four-week period of gym swim descends upon us like the bloated carcass of a catapulted whale, crushing us beneath its wet, foul-smelling body. Forty-some-odd adolescents forced into a cold, overly chlorinated pool for fifties minutes. It was hell on earth, basically. As I've mentioned in a previous post, I am autistic, so the echoing sounds reflected fluorescent lights, pungent odors, slimy floors, and assorted nonsense made the situation even worse for me. I wasn't officially diagnosed yet, so my complaints were written off as me being whiny, and I was told to shut up and deal with it. So I did. I think I had more meltdowns in that four-week span than I've had in the past two years combined, but whatever. On top of the sensory overload, there was Jack. He made frequent attempts to grab me, which was disgusting, and I spent most of the class trying to evade him. He managed to sneak up behind me and snap the strap of my top, but I jerked away fast enough to prevent that. I was furious at this point, but I'm like 5'2", maybe, whereas he was easily over 6'5", probably 300 pounds, and I'm not stupid. While all of this was happening, my new gym teacher, they switched every semester, was busy trying to keep a couple of the other guys from drowning each other. She was one adult forced to watch over 40 rowdy kids in a swimming pool. She was a bit preoccupied. The final straw came one Wednesday afternoon, the event that finally pushed me off the edge of the rationality I'd been clinging to and sent me plummeting into full-on bloodthirst. There I was, paddling around, minding my own business, when Jack and his two goons managed to corner me. I'm immediately suspicious, hackles raised, as they ask me fairly banal questions about how the pool is today and the like, sniggering the whole time. I give short, terse answers, trying to see if I could maybe slip past them. I spotted an opening and bolt for it, but Jack was apparently expecting this. As I swim through the narrow gap between him and one of his friends, he stretches his arm out and tries to inappropriately touch me. I froze for a moment, the delighted giggling of him and his friends echoing in my ears as if from a thousand miles away. The next thing I knew, I was out of the pool, being held back by the gym teacher, and Jack had a bloody nose. He was shouting angrily at me, calling me a crazy witch, as his nose gushed blood into the water. There was mass confusion among the class. I was told to change quickly and sit in the hallway. Apparently, the gym teacher had heard me screech like a banshee, followed by a number of shouts, and had looked over to see me wrestle out of Jack's grip, jump on his back, and throw him off balance enough to smash his face into the edge of the pool wall. 
I remembered none of this, but I did find a few chunks of greasy brown hair clenched in my fist that I'd evidently ripped from his scalp when the teacher pulled me off. I washed my hands thoroughly. It was decided that I'd go to school early tomorrow to have a little talk with the dean. They would have sent me there straight away, but Jim was my last class of the day, and the dean had already left by then for whatever reason, so it had to be postponed a little while. It was pretty heavily implied that I was going to be suspended, quite possibly even expelled, for what had happened. I was furious. Not only had Jack made my life a living hell, but his inappropriate nonsense was now going to be the cause of my expulsion. I wasn't about to go down without a fight, but I realized that I'd have to play this pretty smart if I wanted to weasel out of it. The next morning, I did two things. I put on mascara, and I made a superficial but rather painful incision on my right thigh, high enough so as to be covered by my shorts. Normally, I hate wearing makeup because I don't like the way it feels, but I'd worn mascara before and noticed the interesting effect it had on my appearance. Specifically, I already have pretty long, pretty dark eyelashes, so adding mascara draws a lot of attention to my eyes and makes them look huge. Like total Bambi eyes. Wide, innocent, naive, harmless. I sat down in front of the dean at 6, 40 a.m. I didn't need to fake the fear in my expression, but I made sure to throw in something that could be interpreted as guilt, too bowing my head and twisting my face in dismay. Needless to say, the dean was pretty mad. Do you know why you're here, young lady? He said. Yes, I said softly. And you know that what you did is very serious? Yes, I said again, making my voice tremble. Care to explain yourself then? I, I began, my voice shaking. I just wanted him to stop. Stop what? the dean prompted, his eyebrows furrowed. I just wanted him to stop touching me, I blurted. As I said this, I reached my hand under the table where he couldn't see it and dug my finger into the cut on my leg, causing me to lurch forward as if in a sob, my other hand covering my face as my eyes watered from the pain. What are you talking about? the dean asked, his brows now on a collision course for Mars. I spent the next several minutes divulging all the nonsense that had happened to me that year, digging into my injury for some tears whenever necessary. And by the end of it, the dean looked horrified. He reaffirmed that, no, I shouldn't have attacked Jack like that, but that they'd have to investigate the matter further. I basically got off with a slap on the wrist, and after multiple testimonies from other girls, Jack got suspended for two weeks. I wasn't satisfied. They hadn't been able to expel him due to lack of hard evidence, but I was out for blood. He returned to school two weeks later, and I was ready. One of his friends had a little brother in my bio class, a fairly chill dude named Owen, who I had worked out a deal with. See, Jack had been very vocal about his displeasure with me to his friends, which made its way to Owen, who, for the low, low price of bailing him out in biology, was more than willing to share that information with me. I had a direct pipeline. Anything Jack shared with his friends made its way directly to me via Owen, and as it turns out, this dude didn't keep a whole lot to himself. There was a lot of stuff I was tempted to nail him for. For instance, I found out he was selling drugs, mostly Adderall and some occasional weed, from his locker, and had been cheating his way through most of his classes. However, I knew how suspicious it would look for me to report something like that so soon. It would probably just look like I had a grudge, which I did, and was trying to get even, which I was. He slipped up really, really bad about a week after his return, and that was when I struck. See, he hadn't been subtle about his displeasure with my retaliation and spent most of gym class sending really ugly looks my way. The gym teacher kept us as far away from each other as possible, but he managed to track me down in a passing period one day and rant at me about how I had screwed him over and that I was a lying little witch. Yada, 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 and that he'd make me regret it. Funny, he stole the words right out of my mouth. I found out from Owen later that Jack had been bragging to his friends last night about the switchblade he'd stolen from one of those hunting stores downtown and promised he'd show it off to them later that day. I seized the opportunity. I took a few seconds in the bathroom mirror, scratching at the scab on my leg until my eyes were teary enough to really sell the terrified victim look, then bolted down to the dean's office, stuttering and shaking, crying out for help. The front desk lady was understandably startled by the sight of a seemingly panicked freshman girl bolting into the office and called the dean out right away. His face grew serious when he saw me. Em, Mr. Dean, please help. He's going to kill me, I cried. Now, slow down, he said. What happened? 
Jack, I said, resisting the urge to grin maniacally at the hardness that appeared in the dean's eyes. Hey, he cornered me in the hall. He called me a witch and said he was going to make me regret telling on him. He, he's, he's got a knife. He, what? The dean barked. Everything moved very quickly after that. The security guards were told to search the kid's locker, while a couple other security officers were called down to get Jack out of his classroom and take him to the office. I was told by the front desk lady, who had heard the whole exchange, to hide with her in the copier room so Jack wouldn't see me. They found the stolen knife in his backpack and the drugs in his locker. That, combined with his previous charges, was enough to get him not only expelled, but arrested. I never saw him again, which is probably a good thing because I'm still mad and would probably try to kill him if given the opportunity. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. I, 26 female at the time, had just started dating Thomas, 28 male, and things seemed promising. Very sweet man, educated and quite smart, good looks. After seven weeks of dating, he invited me and two of his childhood friends, let's call them Alex and Bart, for a long 29th birthday celebration weekend at his father's country house in a small French town. His father was going to be around as well, and I was very excited to meet everyone. Day one, Friday, is fun. I am happy to get along well with Thomas's father, a smart and caring man. Day two, Saturday. After a very nice day, we enjoy a party in the garden with the neighbors, including some friends of Thomas. After a few hours and lots of drinks, a group of people gather around a small campfire and start sharing childhood memories. This is where things go wrong. At first, of course, innocent and dumb stories as you would expect. But then Thomas and his friends started sharing really sick stuff. In particular, they told a story about how, when they were 14 or 15 years old, they found it very amusing to bully for almost six months Arthur, a boy of their school who was very isolated and shy, making jokes, calling names, you name it. As if this was not enough, they created a fake girl profile on Missing Messenger, a computer platform to exchange live messages that we used in years 2000s, and spent months exchanging messages with him under the false girl identity, flirting and developing a false relationship with the poor boy. Some people were confident at school, and it became a big and cruel joke behind Arthur's back. They used pictures of Bart's real cousin, and the boy truly thought he had some kind of online girlfriend to whom he even sent confessions and love messages. At some point, they got bored and scheduled a false rondez, Vu's IRL asking the boy to take a bus for two or three hours, wearing a shirt Elmer, the elephant based on a private joke. Obviously, there was no one waiting for him, and they did not know how long he waited over there, by himself. If Arthur had not already understood what was going on, he found out the next day at school, after Thomas and Bart told the story to everyone and even shared the love messages that Arthur had been writing. The poor boy stopped coming to class and apparently changed school, and it is easy to imagine that this must have been extremely traumatizing to him. Do you think that Thomas, Alex, and Bart had any bit of shame about it? Not a bit of remorse, in particular, on Thomas and Bart's side. They kept making jokes about it and even seemed to regret that they were not good enough at being evil to convince the boy to send nudes or sexy pics. I don't even want to imagine what would have happened if he had done so. To say that I felt uncomfortable would be a gross understatement. I was absolutely horrified and started to despise Thomas more than anything. I was not the only one shocked. Thomas's father, who heard the end of the story, had the most disappointed look in the eyes. His stupid son was so drunk that he did not even notice it. I escaped the party immediately after that and got back to the house. I could not sleep at all this night, and I kept thinking about the evening and how Thomas was still finding this funny. I heard him coming to bed around forum, but I pretended I was asleep. Day three, Sunday, was the actual birthday, and the initial plan was that I would take Thomas on a one, one fancy surprise date for lunch nearby, and then we would meet the group for a late afternoon party. But instead, I woke up very early on Sunday morning took all my stuff in silence and went alone to the train station, where I took a direct train heading back to Paris. I decided to send a text to Thomas wishing him happy birthday and telling him to meet me at a certain location one hour from the house for a surprise, and that I needed to go a little bit in advance to make sure that everything would be perfect. I had picked the location randomly using Google Maps to gain time. Thomas read the text around Tenham when he woke up. He responded with excitement that he would follow the instructions religiously. 
When he arrived there at 12.30, I told him to wait further as there was little delay on something. Then I asked him to meet me at a restaurant which was 30 men drive from the initial location. When he arrived at 13.15, I texted him that I was on my way, would arrive in 20 men, and that he will understand when he saw me why I made him wait. I also asked him to order some food and the most expensive bottle on the menu. Around 13.30, he started calling me several times and sent a lot of worried texts, and after 45 minutes, I responded in French. So, how does it feel to have people play with your feelings? Then I stopped responding. I let him call and text the entire afternoon, but never responded. At some point, an unknown number called me it was his friend Alex asking what was going on, and that Thomas' birthday was completely ruined because of what I did. I just responded, this is an extremely small payback for what you did to Arthur. Tell Thomas to stop calling me, and hung up. I blocked them. I still felt bad the entire evening as I had started to grow attached to Thomas back then. The following days, a common friend called me to say that my reaction was completely absurd and unfair, that it was not my role to punish someone for actions they did as a teenager, that they were adult ways of saying things, and that I had been completely crazy. Only a few people supported what I did. Everyone else seemed to think that I was a bitch. Thomas tried to fix things and win me back for a few months afterwards. I never responded to any of his messages. I don't regret it. I simply hope that Arthur, who should be 35 or 36 years old now, is well. The setup. Our tale begins in my teen years about 10, 11 years ago. It was summer and my parents wanted to go on vacation. Me, being a 16-year-old dumb teenager with both a gaming addiction and seeing my cue to living the free, independent, unsupervised life, offered to house and dog site while they and my sister went on vacation. Some important background information. I'm from a safer place than the U.S. We lived in the suburbs and I was taught most life skills by the time I was 12. The only dangers I could be exposed to would be alcohol poisoning. You know, the typical threats for a boy in a country in which 16-year-olds can buy beer. The Boy and the Karen Megasaurus Rex, Week 1 While gaming took 90s of my time away and I developed the day and night schedule of a back-end developer, I still did all the chores around the house with a few exceptions since I deemed they could wait. I checked the mailbox and there is a handwritten letter with runes of the ancient. Using my old doctor's notes as a Rosetta Stone, I deciphered that it was from the president of our equivalent of our equivalent of an HOA. Imagine an HOA with a fifth of the power the typical ho in us would have. A Hawkeye of the HOA Avengers. If it was in a sport, it would only receive participation awards. You get the point. The Maria written tomb said that the grass of my front law was too tall according to regulations. I went out, took a look at the grass, which was maybe one come too tall. That's the equivalent of a jelly bean to my freedom measurement, folks. Same day I cut the grass, because might as well do so to keep the peace. The day after, a new letter written by the same Shakespeare wannabe came. I grabbed my Indiana Jones hat and performed a heathen ritual in the shed to read the message. The roses in my front yard were going too far out through the fence by 15 chem. That's an average-sized carrot in Murakana. I once again comply. On the third day, the true cause of annoyance said to me, my backyard bushes were too tall. Here is where I finally get irritated since you have to enter my parents' property to check the bush's height with Satan's three commandments in hand. I go and visit my direct neighbor, who I knew was on the HOA board. I ask her about the Gutter Speak letters, and she looks through them and laughs. Those are from the banshee of Arrakis Aka Karen, who lived ten houses further down the street. She had been kicked out of the HO board after she poisoned three dogs in the neighborhood with rat poison lace treats. Not wanting to deal with her after she threw rocks at me when I was trick-or-treating as a child, I decided to let the case rest and leave the bushes untrimmed. The boy, the planted bomb, and the instigation. Fast forward a week into my parents' vacation. After being alone for seven days, I decided to do something. As any teenager would, I started to plan a party, and like the good kid I was, I went around to all my nearby neighbors and warned them about the potential noise which parties tend to create. At some point here, I remembered the saying witches be fading, but a good counter-strike match lasts forever. Instead of holding a straight-up party, I decided to invite friends over to a LAN party so we could play Counter-Strike Source and quickly replace the white blood cells in our body with whatever was in the knockoff energy drinks. Fast forward to said LAN party. My parents' dining room smells like teenage farts, Axe body spray, sweat, and all chips in the world mixed together. Typical LAN stuff. 1. 0 a.m. 
there's a loud knock on the door. I go out to see two cops looking at me with a surprised Pikachu face. I look at them with the same amount of confusion. Cop 1. We have a report that there is a loud party going on and there might be several miners doing drugs here. Me. Do energy drinks count as drugs? Cop 2. No. Me, then I have no idea what you were talking about. Cop 1. We had a frantic woman calling constantly, which is why we came, but it seems we are more of a disturbance than you guys are. At the same time, one of my friends can be heard in the background. Cop, get in here. The bomb has been planted and you are the only one alive. Cop 1. Counter-Strike. Me. Counter-Strike. We will leave you to it then. Cops left and we lost the match. Unrelated though. Two days after, I get another knock on my door. There she is, the bane of all good. She who must not be mentioned without carrying Miriak's sword and a towel on you. She starts screaming that me and my drug party kept her up all night, and that I'm a horrible brat who needs to tend to my bushes if my parents doesn't want to lose the house. At this point, I stop her and remind her that, one, the HOA doesn't have the power to do that. They hardly have the power to do anything except approve of house owners' requests. Two, that she was kicked out of the HOA due to the poison incident. Three, that I didn't even have a party. Four, that she needs to stay away from my backyard. She got even madder and started screaming that she would have me and my parents arrested and that the poison treats were meant for my dog as well. I slammed the door on her faster than hyperspacing from Argos RHO. She had royally pissed me off. No one threatens my good boy. No one. Perfect legal pettiness. So now we are at our final act, my revenge. I had about four days before my parents returned, so I made them count. I called the police and visited my real HO a neighbor and got all the necessary approvals. Then I went over and talked with the neighbors surrounding her house. I would do all the yard work, which involved loud equipment around her house. Legally, we were allowed to make noise from 8, 0 a.m. till 8, 0 p.m. with yard work, but it's considered rude to do it after 5, 0 p.m. That didn't stop me, though. Like a druid on Paragon level 256, I just kept sending leaves and grass flying, as if all the bushes, trees, and odd plants had pissed in my grandfather's ashes. She came out and screamed at me, even threw a rock at me. It brought back old memories, but I didn't care. I was going to make as much legal sound as possible. Whenever she complained, I just told her that their plants were not up to house standard. Friday rolls around. It's 8, 0. Um, me and my friends gathered in front of our house. We have all the tools ready. Purchased by the blood coin of my insanity-induced labor the two days prior. It's time to make her pay. We turn on the speaker, the BB key, and crack up a beer. The speaker is set to the exact legal limit of how loud the music is allowed to be. Most of her neighbors come out and join during the day, since I had invited them while kill-billing their plants. She screamed constantly for an hour, called the cops twice, which left after seeing my permits from themselves in the HOA. That's right. If you want a party to complain about, then you shall get the finest party of the Shire just outside of your house. We kept it up to the exact time limit. I hope you enjoyed that Mrs. Karen. For context, I'm in a couple of medieval festivals as an actor. Think of those street characters from the Disney parks, except it only happens annually. I play two completely different characters in these festivals. Mm. My more known character is known for two things. Her obsession with spoons. The utensil. Her eye patch. This is to help kids doing these scavenger hunts to find me. I am wandering around the second festival as my lesser known character a cowardly wizard who accidentally took over a couple feet of land who owns a baby dragon. I am interacting with various patrons as this character when this woman approaches me. Let's call her Karen. Where is your eye patch? Karen screamed. I looked at her confused. I'm sorry, I stated. I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no need for an eye patch. Don't act stupid, Karen shouted. You have an eye patch. I know you have one. I raised my eyebrow. I don't know what you mean, I stated. Karen began screaming in a language that could summon demons before shoving the scavenger hunt from back when the first festival took place, early June. It seemed she thought I was that character in a different costume. My character for festival wears green and brown with the eye patch. My character for festival B wears red, white, and gold. They wear glasses, no eye patch. I sighed and shook my head. I'm not character name from festival, I, I stated. 
My name is character name from Festival B. I'm sorry. Cue the demon summoning screams. I just shook my head and walked away. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.